Yo, pretty ladies around the world, have you heard that Book 2 of Infinity Train is almost here? But I have not finished talking about Book 1 on this channel yet, so that's what this video is going to be all about. I'm going to be covering episodes 6 through 10, so if you haven't heard my thoughts on the first 5 episodes of The Perennial Child, I suggest you watch Part 1 of my review first. Without further ado, let's get on to talking about the... Gravity... turtle car? The unfinished car. This episode sets up quite a few pieces for the finale. We get a cryptic, foreshadowy preview of the primary antagonist's motivation and shortcomings. You can't even make a car without any turtles in it! And we get clues to the identity of 1-1. One 1-1 one. One one is practically incapable of controlling themselves when the layout of the car is not up to their envisioned specifications. When the gravity is all weird and the walls are missing, 1-1 one one sees this as Ron. It's something 1-1 one one has to fix because it is their job, it is their duty to make sure everything is correct and right. It doesn't matter that the residents of this car are very happy with the architecture and are content living their lives this way and have formulated all their routines around this layout. One One's hyperfixation can't see this situation as anything but incorrect. This episode makes it so One One being the conductor is well within expectations for when that reveal drops. The emotional core of this episode is Tulip seeing some of the life experiences she's had reflected in the attitude and perspective one one is currently holding, and using the wisdom she's gained from having to deal with her parents divorcing to connect with one one and let them know that it's okay for things to appear on, and it's not anyone's fault and it's not anyone's responsibility to fix it because life can just sometimes be messy that way. It was very heartwarming to see Tulip apply what she's learned, and the dialogue was very poignant. I know what it's like to think that if you had just been better, things would have been different. That you're responsible for fixing things that are beyond your control. Just know that I speak from experience when I say, this is not your fault. What I found really cool is that we've seen Tulip in the past state that she knows she's not responsible for her parents divorcing. Tula, please. We just want you to know none of this is your fault. I know that. Why would it be? It is very plausible to feel something despite knowing better, but I do personally think that this is something Tula picked up on way earlier in her life, way before the series even started, because her parents used to fight all the time even when she was a little kid. Tulip has likely experienced these feelings of blame and responsibility when she was still a little tyke, but as she grew up over the course of years, she was able to come to an understanding that her parents' fighting isn't her fault. Although yes, it's still very possible to sometimes feel that way despite knowing better. This is what I really like about Tulip, she is clearly having a hard time managing the fact that her parents went through a divorce at the start of the series, but nonetheless she is not completely ill-equipped to deal with life's troubles. She has been dealing with a problematic family dynamic for a while, and it shows because when the opportunity to grow presents itself, she very much takes that opportunity and learns from it and turns into a more well-rounded, better-adjusted person. That's why Infinity Train is so cool in my opinion, because Tulip is an awesome character and you can see why and how she's capable of growth. So yeah, I really like this episode. It does take its sweet time to get to that emotional communication between 1-1 and Tulip, but it was a fun ride getting there and it was well worth the payoff. Up next, episode 7, The Chrome Car. So, a lot of times in fiction, when there's a mirror version of a character, it often represents that character's repressed feelings, repressed emotions, it's often the shadow self of that person that has to be tackled or overcome or accepted in some way, and that is not at all what is happening here. It's a bit of a subversion of what I was expecting, and honestly, I loved it, because Mirror Tulip is not a reflection of Prime Tulip at all. I mean, she literally is, but as a character, she's completely her own person with her own likes, dislikes, interests, and desires. She has nothing to do with Prime Tulip as a character, and that's kind of awesome. Her name isn't even Mirror Tulip. I don't even have a name. I'm gonna refer to her as that in this review because by the end of the episode she hasn't settled on a name yet, but I think it's really important to still remember that she doesn't even identify as Tulip. Good luck, Tulip Prime. Good luck, Mirror... well... good luck to you. Whoever you turn out to be. 
I also love how even in an episode that's a few degrees removed from the dealing with divorce plotline, we still have Tulip's character further being fleshed out. Prime Tulip used to think that she's fine handling all her problems on her own. You never ask for help. I'm not ignoring everyone. I can just handle my problems myself. That's completely different. But after reflecting on it for a brief moment, she realizes that no, she should be more willing to accept help from others. Okay, you're right. I don't like asking for help when I have a problem. I guess I should. Which is a realization I don't think she would have had, had she not been traveling with 1-1 and Atticus for the many train cars they've gone through. Being able to see the sequential steps of Tulip's growth, and being able to understand why she's having the little epiphanies that she does, is just so awesome. I was also really appreciative of the amount of empathy that Prime Tulip displays throughout this episode. Mirror Tulip tricked her and was gonna leave her trapped, but Tulip nevertheless wants to help her. She does not want Mirror Tulip to get killed. <gasps> you can't kill her! I, I just thought she'd go to jail or something! She's able to empathize with the existential struggle that Mirror Tulip has been facing throughout her whole existence. Which, speaking of that entire existence, like, I don't think Tulip's reflection in the real world was actually sentient the entire time. I feel like the Infinity Train must have retroactively bestowed memories onto the reflection of Tulip, which, by the way, Mirror Tulip is Prime Tulip's actual real-world reflection. When Prime Tulip returns to the real world, she is lacking a reflection in the mirror, and you know somebody's gonna mistake her for a vampire, and that's gonna be a whole fiasco go in the future. But yeah, back to this episode. Wow, it was just wonderful. What a wild ride. It was a complete blast and delight to watch. I absolutely loved the reflection police. The two flex agents were a hoot. Whoa! Hey, man. Do we really need the sander for this? Oops. You want that little defect running around in the prime world? We keep the barrier intact. You got that? I got it. I got it. I love how their masks, even when they lack detail, manage to give this slight, uncanny valley vibe, and I love how their heads actually look. Their whole designs and their whole manner of speech was just excellent. I love these two dudes. I think this is my second favorite episode of the whole miniseries. The cat's car is in my number one spot, as I discussed in part one of my review, but the chrome car is the runner-up. Alright, we're gonna move on ahead to the ball pit car, where we get some childhood fun and a bunch of trauma! Wow, could the two halves of this episode not be more starkly different. The first half is this relaxing diversion for our characters before Tulip is just straight up plunged into despair. I mean, you could kinda tell what was coming. It was way too happy and easy for things to not end in disaster by the end. And also, if you kept your eyes peeled, you could see the shadow of the steward skittering about. I actually did not care for the first half at all. I mean, it wasn't like bad, I didn't hate sitting through it, but it just wasn't doing anything for me. As a kid, I used to sometimes go to fast food places that had these sorts of ball pits and slides and setups like that, so I can relate to it. I can relate to that early childlike wonder of playing in those things, but nonetheless, I just was kind of waiting for the episode to get to where it was inevitably gonna go. And once the conductor enters the scene and Tulip is isolated and the music amps up, oh, it was so good. All the stakes and danger finally manifesting was just so captivating. So, for a brief moment, I legit thought Atticus was killed off. My stomach was sinking, because I thought we had a pseudo-on-screen dog death happening. But then Atticus gets turned into one of those roach dogs that appeared in episode 1, and while if he had stayed this way, it might be a fate potentially even worse than death, the fact that he was transformed into something made me think that, like, yeah, by the end of the series, Tulip is likely to find a way to bring him back. So on one hand, it did diminish the agony of the situation, because I went from thinking that a character died to thinking that they were going to be saved at a later time. But on the other hand, it was still really friggin' sad. Seeing Tulip cry, just seeing her bawl her eyes out as the episode draws to a close, that was powerful stuff. Even though as a viewer I expected Atticus to be restored, I still connected to the anguish, to the emotions that Tulip was feeling. I mean, how could you not? 
One last thought about this episode before I move on. I found it quite interesting how the conductor is willing to kill residents of the train that had an origin on the train, but she is deliberately leaving Tulip unharmed. I mean, Tulip got scuffed up, but at no point does the conductor actually want to kill Tulip. The life forms of the train, like the cat, are disposable, one one she'd rather just have dead. But when it comes to humans who ran away from life's problems and found themselves on the Infinity Train just like she did, she doesn't want to kill those people, she doesn't actually want to be a murderer in the most technical sense of it. She clearly still has some boundaries and morals. There's still some humanity left in her, even if she doesn't apply that humanity towards beings that originated on the train. Which isn't that funny when she's trying to make Ulrich. I feel like there's a clear dissonance between how she views the creations that were already on board versus the creation she's trying to make for herself. But I don't feel that's a contradiction to the plot, rather it's just a testament to how warped Amelia's mind has become from the many years she's been trapped on the train and how much her own train of thought unintended pun there, doesn't actually follow much rational sense. I'm getting ahead of myself here, obviously. I've been calling, quote-unquote, the conductor Amelia already when we don't find that out until the next episode. But I'm doing that because I feel like the conductor's actions towards Tulip really set up the groundwork for what kind of person Amelia is. And I tend to be very appreciative when groundwork is laid out ahead of time. So with that being said, let's move on to the next episode, the penultimate episode, The Past Car. The episode starts with Tulip in the throes of defeatism. On one hand, I was rather impressed at Tulip's ability to internalize that the corgi companion she once knew is gone. He's not Atticus anymore. However, in this case, acceptance comes with a bunch of mental baggage that makes Tulip not even want to try anymore. Until the smooth-talking cat intervenes, Tulip was ready to succumb to being stuck on the train. Which is another example that goes to show that you can't always tackle hardship on your own. The cat was just another connection made along the way that, in the end, helped Tulip emerge victorious. I also think it's safe to say the morally ambiguous feline did develop a soft spot for Tulip. You're my favorite person, arbitrarily named after a particular kind of flower. Sure, the cat seems to have an honor system to her somewhat dishonest trades, but I don't think the cat would have helped Tulip to such an extent if she didn't feel at least some legitimate remorse and a desire for Tulip's well-being. Also, I loved how careful Tulip was about accepting the cat's help. Tulip learns from her experiences and her mistakes. That's been evident, and it continues to be evident. Once inside the tape, the flashbacks were a real tone changer at first, but that's accurately captured in the continued frustration Tulip has at all these seemingly random happy memories. Plus, I gotta admit, the brief break from all the bleakness was also somewhat welcome at this point. Who's this goof? I gotta point out, Schoolboy Ulrich's essay was about the themes of Alice in Wonderland, and it was really cool how the creators actually made this essay legible if you paused the episode. And if you paused the episode, the parallels between Infinity Train and Alice in Wonderland should be clear as day. A child trying to understand the world of adults, themes of identity, growing up by interacting with those different from you? This is also what Infinity Train was all about. What a fun little detail. As for other fun details to keep your peepers peeled for, did you notice the jam? And hey, how about that turtle handkerchief that the conductor used on Tulip in the prior episode? At one point in the tape, Amelia and Ulrich use a certain tone to hijack a phone network and make a free call, an act that falls under the term phone freaking, which was actually a real thing people used to engage in. The coolest thing about this detail is this is how the steward was being controlled throughout the series. You freak into its command system. <laughs> You might recall how in part one of my review, I was confused as to why the steward skittered away from 1-1 back in the episode The Corgi Car. Well, now that makes absolute sense, because 1-1 inadvertently hummed the freaking frequency. <laughs> And in the final episode, after finding their mum, 1-1 purposefully halts the steward's advance. 
That's really neat, although I had managed to completely miss this detail on my first watch through. One small personal gripe I had about the flashback was treating the reveal of who died as this surprise moment. For me, that just felt unintentionally flippant. Like, it lessened the emotional weight of the backstory. Since Tulip had already erroneously assumed Ulrich was the conductor from the robo-voice in the getup, I think the experience would have been more emotionally grounded if the following scene simply showed Amelia withdrawing and grieving, rather than going for that whole robed mystery figure routine. Which, I think at that point, most viewers would have already assumed the reason we're not seeing the person's face is because it must not be Ulrich's? Because why else hide it? It just served as cheap drama, and for me, cheap drama does the opposite of heightening my emotions. It makes me detach. It is neat that Amelia turned out to be the antagonist, because in media it's still extremely more common for a man to lose their female love interest for character motivation rather than vice versa, but staging it as a surprise reveal conflicts with the feelings of grief we should be focusing on. And while we're speaking of traditional role reversals, I found Amelia's super smooth proposal to Ulrich ever so sweet. That was a surprise moment I can 100% get behind. They're such adorable goofs. This moment made me love them despite how little on-screen time we had with them. So, after seeing Amelia's life circumstances, Tulip is upset that she can't help but have empathy. And I'm just gonna play the clip, because this moment is so, so good. But now I know she's a person named Amelia, who was in love, and she's hurt. And she's running away from the changes in her life. Because she's afraid. <sighs> like me. In my opinion, it's pretty hard to have a character summarize the personal growth they're currently undergoing without it sounding cheesy, but Infinity Train really pulls it off each and every time. It sounds and feels so genuine and earned. Tulip has earned these realizations. That's why it works so well. This development grants Tulip exit from the Infinity Train, but she's not leaving without saving Atticus, because Tulip is a fucking badass and is willing to fight for her loved ones. There's only one episode left, and it takes place in the engine. So I gotta say, Tulip didn't really have to repurpose a cannon like the cat implied, she just had to use the right ammo, which is as simple as sticking a ball into a hole. It's cartoony, but also, this is all tech that Amelia had already reverse engineered, and that's why it's so user accessible. It was a little awkward though how drastically the cannon reduces in size relative to when it was attached to the outside of the train. Speaking of things changing in size, Amelia's mecha suit was also really variable, especially across episodes. On average, it shrinks way down in the final episode. Now, part of this size irregularity does feel like intentional creative liberty, where the conductor is made to look gargantuan to tower over Tulip when it overpowers her and comes off like this insurmountable threat back in the ball pit car. But in the engine, the power dynamic between the two has been more equalized due to Tulip's new knowledge and resolve, and thus the mech suit no longer looks as large or threatening. That being said, I still do wish there was more consistency, with more emphasis on perspective and framing, like in this shot for example, rather than just allowing the character model to grow and shrink to such extents. As for Tulip being physically powerful enough to withstand the swings of a mech with her trusty donut holer, well, Amelia still doesn't actually want to kill Tulip. It would make sense for her not to use the full strength capacity of her machine, so I think that checks out. Although I guess you could still attribute some feats to cartoon physics, because Atticus destroys the steward with an uppercut. It was a bit of a blink and you'll miss it moment, but more so a how the hell is he even able to do that moment? This cartoon corgi packs a punch. But let's now finally talk about the meat of this episode. Let's talk some more about Amelia, because this episode is largely about her. I assume Amelia must have been trapped within her own videotape before, because she programmed a defense function into her mecha to counter this exact scenario. She's aware of how the tape works, at least. It was her idea to trap Tulip with it, after all. I still wanted to help you. I send the cat to offer you your tape to live inside your happiest memories. But what do you do with my gift? You reject it. 
Which raises the question, why did Amelia not just settle for the world inside the tape where she can still see Alric? According to her own words, this would be a gift, right? Well, Amelia happens to be a hypocrite, undergoing some major cognitive dissonance, and as mentioned before, she doesn't seem to follow rational trains of thought all the way to the end, or those thoughts become warped along the way from her fractured perspective. I mean, if we're gonna represent the figurative literally, she got to the end of the infinity train, she reached the engine, but her number was only going up the whole time. Just why would Amelia presume Tulip should be content with the tape world when Amelia herself wasn't? Because Amelia sees her circumstances and emotions as different from Tulip's, whereas Tulip is able to see how much alike the two of them really are. <sighs> like me. I mean, I think, given enough time, Amelia would probably just break out of the tape on her own in a similar way Tulip did, if she hasn't already done so in the past. You insensitive! How dare you force me to relive those memories! I mean, clearly Amelia was not having a happy time inside the tape world. So my view is that Amelia's warped mind is able to accept the fact that Ulrich is dead, and she is aware that making another Ulrich in the train wouldn't be the same as the old Ulrich. Then they wouldn't be my real parents. They wouldn't be my real life. They weren't happy together. I could make you a car where they are. I can make a car that's exactly how you want it to be. The problem here is that Amelia is desperate and has fixated on the idea that her idealized perfect train car would be enough to make her happier, even if it's not the same Ulrich, it's still an Ulrich, it's still some sort of remnants of Ulrich that she can recreate. She still sees it as a better alternative than letting go. Now, if Amelia was able to construct her perfect train car, and all signs point to her not being able to do that no matter how much time she spends at it, would she even be satisfied with the end result? I would say, hell no, she would still end up miserable. Clinging to the past rather than moving forward just doesn't work, no matter what approach you try. I really liked Amelia as an antagonist to Tulip, and I like how book one of the series left her character arc so open-ended for the conclusion. Amelia did have a rapport form with Tulip in their final moments together, but will she be able to internalize Tulip's words and work towards unwarping her self-destructive perspective on life? Something we do have to consider is that Amelia can't try to fight back at this moment, even if she wanted to. The mech suit is destroyed, the steward is destroyed, Amelia can't exert physical dominance to get her way anymore, for now at least. So she's pretty much been forced into a state of temporary self-reflection. In the future, when left to her own devices, will she choose to walk a path of self-redemption, or will she slip back into self-destruction? Maybe we'll find out in the future installments of Infinity Train. Oh, I guess I should probably comment on the turtles. Unbelievable. Again with the turtles. A part of it is that it's a mental hang-up derived from the turtles on her handkerchief, which Amelia clearly still treasures that item. If you recall, there was also jam in the train cars she was creating, a food item that Ulrich was a big fan of. Human minds often tie meanings to arbitrary objects that represent something larger. These are things that remind Amelia of Ulrich, and that's why they keep popping up in her creations. But also there's some major symbolism going on with the turtles as well. Turtles can represent the ability to endure and persist, traits which are usually seen in a positive light. But as we saw for Amelia, that can also just end up paving the road to hell. And when I think of turtle imagery, I also think of withdrawing, you know, receding into your shell. And yeah, after the death of Ulrich, Amelia was withdrawn from others. Hey, come on, please open up. Look, I know it's hard, but it'll be good to go. We're all here for you. She isolated herself from her loved ones and withdrew into her grief where it only festered over the years. She literally donned a mech suit that hides her from the world, a protective outer shell. So yeah, from a symbolic perspective, the turtles make absolute sense too. I think it was an awesome element to include into the story. This definitely ain't like Over the Garden Wall, where the turtles lacked any consistent symbolic meaning in relation to the characters. Seriously, those black turtles were intriguing, but so haphazardly implemented. 
Sorry about the tangent, but this review is drawing to a close, just as Tulip's journey drew to a close after she hugged the loved ones she might never get to see again. Jeez, that was a bittersweet moment. The epilogue was very brief, and the show time skips past how Tulip went about explaining her absence to her parents, but I don't think it was necessary to portray those events. The epilogue accomplishes what it sets out to do, which is just to relay the underlying theme of adapting to change one last time, and end on an uplifting note for our hero. So bud, you ready? I'm ready for anything. Thank you for watching, I hope you had fun listening to my thoughts on book one of Infinity Train. Book two is gonna be airing on Cartoon Network like any day now, for all I know it might air tomorrow or hell even today depending on when this video gets uploaded. I really hope book two stays awesome, and I'll probably end up talking about it on this channel. But for now, I bid thee adieu.